we do not have a biological test or a brain test or a MRI scan that we can run on someone and say, hey, this person has schizophrenia. Right, right. We don't have that. And it wasn't until really the, the 1990s, early 2000s, that MR machines got sensitive enough that we could actually start to detect in living humans some of the subtle brain abnormalities that were present in schizophrenia early in the disease course. Mm -hmm. The human brain is the most complex structure in the known universe, and we are in the middle of a scientific revolution to understand its inner workings. Join us for a conversation with world-renowned neuroscientists as they visit Rochester. I am Dr. John Fox, director of the Del Monte Institute for Neuroscience at the University of Rochester, and you are listening to Neuroscience Perspectives. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Neuroscience Perspectives. I'm thrilled to be joined by Dean Salisbury, Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Pittsburgh. Dean is the Principal Investigator of the Clinical Neurophysiology Research Laboratory, and that lab focuses on understanding the pathology and pathophysiology of first episode psychosis and the progressive course of structural and functional impairments in early disease. And Dean, thank you for taking the time to join us to chat about your research while you're here and, and just life in general and what brought you to science. Thanks for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. So let's Let's dive right in. You know, when I think about schizophrenia, you and I share a passion for trying to do something about schizophrenia. I think about um, what, I, what people often call like the, a wicked problem. It's a wicked problem. Nearly 1% of the world's population, there thereabouts, suffers from this chronic disease. For our frontline treatment for schizophrenia is something that was discovered in the late 1940s, early 1950s. That's what we're doing today. Why, in the intervening 75 years, have we not been able to you know, move the ball down the field. You're right. It is a wicked problem, very debilitating disorder. And over half of the people won't even be able to work part-time for the rest of their lives. Drugs, the medications we use, were discovered accidentally years ago, and they really haven't changed. When we look at new medications that were developed, most of them haven't been effective. Right. And yeah. we don't understand the mechanisms. Yeah, yeah. However, I think there's an exciting new trend which is non-invasive brain stimulation. So the non-invasive brain stimulation studies show some promise in having long-lasting effects. Right, right. Yeah, and it's it's one of those things, right? The, the original drugs, D2 antagonists, these dopaminergic drugs, are good at, at treating these psychotic symptoms, which is what everybody associates schizophrenia with. But the truth is what really makes somebody ill with schizophrenia and turns it into a chronic disease is not the psychotic symptoms. It's, it's well, do you, you want to hold forth on that, right? Yeah, so, so we can think about three things. One is sort of the psychotic symptoms that you were talking about, like hearing voices right. or having delusions. And the medications we have treat those really well. Right. What they don't treat are the so-called negative symptoms, which right. is sort of abolition or sort of a lack of, you know, being able to do things or apathy, not caring, or cognitive abnormalities, mm -hmm. you know, sort of an inability to think well, really, right? So, right. And we don't have good medications for that right now. Right. They're really untreated. There are other ways that people are trying to get at those. There are some medications that are uh, under investigation that are trying to target, you had mentioned the D2 receptors, they're trying to target either muscarinic or um, glutamatergic receptors, they haven't had great success in clinical trials. So now you've been up to your elbows in, in this schizophrenia work, but not, not so much on the drug development side, right? I mean, right. You, obviously you know an awful lot about that, but you spent a, spent a career first at Harvard, now at Pittsburgh, um, trying to understand the basic brain physiology, brain mechanisms, structural changes in the brain in schizophrenia. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? And then I'm going to, I'm going to ask you a couple of tough questions about where that's going. We, we do not have a biological test or a brain test or a MRI scan that we can run on someone and say, hey, this person has schizophrenia. Right, right. We don't have that. And it wasn't until really the, the 1990s, early 2000s that MR machines got sensitive enough that we could actually start to detect in living humans some of the subtle brain abnormalities that were present in schizophrenia early in the disease course. Mm -hmm. And so if we think about what areas might be impacted in the disorder, 
first of all, when we think about, you know, sort of the will to act and behave and motor systems, and even to some extent language systems, hearing voices, about 70% of our individuals, even the first time they get sick, hear voices. Mm -hmm. We think about the frontal lobes and we think about the temporal lobes, which are intimately involved in language and behavior and planning and memory. Um, And so when we look early in the disease course, we see that the temporal lobes, particularly in the left side where sort of the expressive language is, those areas show very subtle changes early in the disease course. When you say subtle changes, tell us what those look like. Are we looking at a little bit of brain shrinkage, loss of tissue? That's exactly right. right. What we're seeing is a reduction in gray matter, the gray matter of the brain. Right. And it's probably on the order of about 5% compared to a healthy person of the same age. Gotcha. Yep. And you'll see that in the frontal lobes as well. And so early in the disease course, so right around when psychosis emerges, you will have a large number of people where you can't detect any brain difference. And there's a small number of people that do have some brain difference. So at the group level, we could see a change between a group of healthy people and a group of people at first psychosis. But at the individual level, it's not big enough to use for any diagnostic test. Right, right, right. And what happens during the disease course is the loss that we see, the volume loss or the gray matter volume loss, the sort of shrinking of the gray matter in the brain spreads across the entire brain over a period of 20, 30 years. So it's a very subtle and very slow change in the volume or loss of volume in the brain. So it's interesting, right, because you're you're making a very important point, right? You can see these, these differences at the group level. And the problem is you can't say very much about the individual because there's a lot of noise or a lot of variability. But if in the morning there was a super cheap imaging technology where you could go into CVS something or whatever, you know, yeah. once a week and you get a quick scan for brain volume, the change at the individual subject level might be diagnostic. Would that be a possibility, you think? Or? No, I think you're right. That's a, that's a, that's a good insightful um, comment because um, one thing that we see in the field is that, um, and, and this comes out of the first episode work and following these people longitudinally at first, is, as we mentioned, there is that progression. There is that change. Right. And so what you can see is that there are some brain wave measures that we can get with EEG or MEG, other kinds of imaging measures, and some MRI measures that tell us about the structure. And we can see that those are getting worse right. during the early right. course. And so the question is, well, we want to see people before the psychosis emerges. We want to see, can we detect them, these sort of changes, before they get really bad so that someone starts acting psychotic? Can we halt that process? Can we detect those people and do some sort of intervention? One thing that's happened as a consequence of the first episode work is now in clinics across the U.S. and across the world, we're seeing earlier and earlier intervention of people. And we know from, I think there's, I think there's enough um, uh, evidence out there to show that early intervention, intensive early intervention in people leads to less hospitalizations mm-hmm. and a better prognosis. So we know what does, that. What does that early intervention look like? What, what are we throwing at them? Uh, well, you know? the thing is we don't have medications for everyone. We don't have a new medication yeah. that we can give someone. But if you have, you know, you, you could sort of think that um, intensive family therapy, intensive psychotherapy, building social supports, right. uh, you know, all these kinds of things. It's good for everybody. Yeah. And it really so is beha- very behavioral helpful. changes, withdraw- you know, this is a person who's vulnerable. Let's get them out of the super stressful situations. That is, that's are right. we talking about? I think that's a big part of it. And what yes. about low dose antipsychotics? Is yes, that? I a- think that at once that someone becomes psychotic, yes, absolutely. You right, know, right. They so you wouldn't treat medication. prophylactically. You wouldn't treat yeah. before. Well, the problem point. is, and this gets back to what we mentioned earlier, we don't have a good biomarker or diagnostic Predictor. test right. for it. So. You had, um, you know, you had mentioned earlier about, you know, can we look at change? And one thing that's happened is now that we know there are progressive changes early in disease course, once psychosis emerges, people have started studying clinical high-risk individuals. And what that means is, well, these people don't have psychosis, but we think they might. And these might be teenagers or young, uh, you know, um, adolescents. 
mm-hmm. that look like they're maybe a little further along than the average teenager. They might be having some subtle symptoms. They might be worried about the neighbors or they might say they're hearing things they know they're not real. So it's like, well, they seem to be having these clinical symptoms that aren't um, very severe, but they're subtle and it's this might turn into something. Yeah, so that right. would be a clinical high risk for psychosis. Right, right. And the, the thing is, most of those individuals will not develop psychosis. Yeah, right. If you follow them over two or three years, probably only two in 10. Maybe if they're followed over 10 years, maybe three or four in right, 10. Right. So you can't put everybody so you'd be on, on medication. So unnecessarily treating people. You, yeah, you that's can't not put right, the Jeff. other yeah. people on a lifetime of tranquilizing medication. No, you right, just can't do course, it. No. So what we, what we need to do is we need to know, know what kind of test can we develop that will tell us who's at greatest risk. And you're absolutely right. People who are showing change in brain volumes or behavioral measures or uh, some of the neurophysiological measures that right. we can record, those are the ones that are at greatest risk. But we don't have a solid biomarker of risk yet. Yeah. So there's a lot of research going on right now. But and we that, don't that's have the hope. cornerstone of what you're, you're about, right? That's what your lab is about, trying to develop those biomarkers, neuromarkers of that's risk. That's exactly yeah. right, yeah. yeah. So, so we work in people that have a first episode, and we're trying to find biomarkers um, of the presence of their psychosis that have a, what we call a very large effect size. And what that means is that there's very little overlap with a neurotypical healthy population. So you could really see yeah, yeah. at the individual level that an individual who's scoring poorly on this particular test doesn't really overlap with the usual distribution yeah, of scores. Yeah, yeah. And then the hope is to say we can now take that measure and put that in people that are at clinical high risk, and maybe they'll be 2 out of 10 or whatever the number is that score very poorly on that test or have an abnormality on that test. And then those people, we could maybe have a more aggressive treatment that might include uh-huh. antipsychotic right, medication. Right. Yeah, I would say I always liken this to it's like neuroscientists uh, in the hunt for our version of serum cholesterol, like a test that you would that would be a really good predictor. And everybody listening in will know. Oh yeah, if I get my cholesterol tested and it, I score above two hundred, I probably need to be doing something better. I'm going to develop heart disease, and that's really the same basic logic that we go after in in our field. Yeah, that's precisely right. Dean, I want to go back to, to you. How did a, a lad from Long Island end up at the University of Pittsburgh via Harvard and Whittier College? And give us, give us, give us the, the background, because you're not from a, no more than myself, you're not from a traditional academic family, right? This is, so what's, what's the story? Oh, thank you, John. Yeah, I know you, well, we've known each other for a long time, <laughs> so you, you know my sort of backstory. So, yeah, I come from a, a, a very blue-collar background on Long Island, um, and my mom was, you know, pretty much a single mom for a long time and put herself through college with five children and became a nurse. And, uh, and then my stepdad, when she got remarried, was a printer. And, you know, so um, I, uh, I was always, you know, just uh, good at school and I enjoyed school and I knew I wanted to go to college. Um, no one in my family had gone to college right out of high school before me. And uh, I just somewhat accidentally ended up going to Whittier College in California. I got something in the mail, and they offered me a a scholarship and went there. And I knew I wanted to do psychology, but that's all I knew. I didn't know know anything really about psychology or about science. So I went there, and I I graduated uh, in what they called the Scholars Program, and it was sort of a design-your-own major. And I said, well, you know, I really um, want to go into biological psychology um, because I, I got very much interested in the brain and in and, and, and how that worked and cognition in humans. And um, they did not have cognitive neuroscience, which is what we would say we do, clinical cognitive neuroscience. They didn't have that back in the early 80s, you know. So uh, I went to a biological psychology program at Stony Brook. Um, where I was lucky enough to get into the graduate program there and started learning about human EEG. Um, and I also did uh, some work in animal 
recordings and surgeries and was doing that. But I thought I wanted to be a neuropsychologist, and that's someone who would do a lot of paper and pencil tests and right. um, test you know, children or uh, different kinds of uh, uh, brain injuries. And so I, was, I did a neuropsychology intern, but it happened to be at Stony Brook University Hospital on a psychiatric ward. And that was where I started to get exposure to people with psychiatric illnesses. Um, but my dissertation was actually in sleep, in sleep research <laughs> and doing EEGs on sleep and, uh, and uh, how the brain responds to sounds when you're asleep. And I guess you could say it was essentially how do alarm clocks work, right? Because right. you're sleeping, but the alarm clock still wakes you up, right? So, um, uh, but uh, as it turns out then, I, um, as I was getting ready to graduate, uh, my mentor at the time in graduate school, Nancy Squires. Uh, one of the greats in the yeah, business. She was, yeah, she one, was of one of the pioneers yeah. in Absolutely. EEG work, yeah. yeah. And she, uh, she got a call from, from Bob McCarley's group at Harvard. They were looking for a postdoc, and so I went up and interviewed. And I was going to do a two-year postdoc, and I stayed there for 22 years before <laughs> I moved to Pittsburgh about 11 years ago. Fantastic, fantastic. I mean, it's a great story. And and I think, you know, I, we're about to run out of time, you know, but just just thanks for sharing uh, the, the stuff about schizophrenia. And I think people will really appreciate what, what you're doing. And I know I appreciate the passion that you bring to this. I know that it's like you care deeply about this particular yeah, issue. You, yeah. Uh, and and it's it's been really fantastic for me. I, I, you know, I count you, of course, as a as a long time friend at this point, and we met through science. But it's been really fantastic for me to to follow the science and to have great conversations with you over the years. And so I'm really pleased that we get to share one of those conversations with with our public. Yeah. Oh, so. thank you so much, John. And it's uh, and you've been a great supporter over the years and a good friend. And and, and really, and uh, I hope everyone enjoys it. So cheers, Dean. Thanks very thank much. You.